Father, we, we love you and we praise you. We worship you this morning because you are the good, redeeming God. Lord, we confess that without you we have no hope. There is no redemption. There is no lifting out of the miry clay. There is no new life. We need you for that. Lord, don't let us ever start to get the impression or, or succumb to the pride of life that causes us to think that we might possibly save ourselves. Lord, we ask this morning that you would also show us everything that you have done for us. Lord, help us to be truly grateful for all the blessings in your life, in our lives. And we pray this morning, Lord, that you will supply all of our needs, the needs of the people in our congregation. And Lord, use us to um, minister to the needs of a hurting world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Am I a little loud? Maybe, no? Okay. I thought I was starting to hear a little bit of feedback. All right, please open your Bibles this morning to Psalm chapter 30. Psalm chapter 30. Last week I talked about, when I was talking about the Psalms, I was talking about Psalms of orientation, Psalms of disorientation, and Psalms of new orientation. And in... Um, So, and I gave you some examples of Psalm chapter 1 being the psalm of orientation. It is a psalm that affirms everything that I know to be true. And then there are psalms of disorientation. And it seems like so many of the, uh, the psalms are psalms of disorientation. Why is this happening? I, this, this, this doesn't uh, really go along with everything that I thought was true and right and, uh, and everything about God. And then there are psalms of new orientation where we say, Whew, I'm glad that's over. I'm glad I've gotten through that. I'm glad, thank you God for getting me through that. And now I understand so much better. Uh, and today we're going to be looking at one of those psalms of, of new orientation. And I gave this psalm uh, the title, Let Me Tell You Why I Worship. Uh, and uh, when I think about uh, worship, when I think about worship, well, why do I worship personally? Why do I worship personally? Uh, and I worship personally to, because I want to enjoy Jesus myself. All right, I enjoy Jesus. I enjoy knowing him. I enjoy uh, believing in him. I enjoy hearing about him. Uh, this morning while I was eating breakfast, I was listening to a song called Glorious Day by Casting Crowns. It's a wonderful song. I posted it on our Facebook page. You've got to go listen to it. It is the whole gospel story in, in this song. And so many of the, 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 the great hymns are. They're the whole gospel story. But it's a wonderful story. It's a wonderful way to just sort of ponder Jesus, think about Jesus, absorb again who Jesus is. And you, I just feel this great, incredible personal worship. Uh, but why do we congregate to worship? What's the purpose of congregational worship? Uh, well, because it's good for me to see you having that same experience. It's good, for you to see, uh, it's good for you to see me enjoying Jesus, and it's good for me to see you enjoying Jesus. And it's also good if, if there's ever a non-believer in our presence, it's good for them to say, boy, these people really enjoy Jesus. These people really love the Lord. There must be something to him. There must, maybe, maybe I should rethink uh, God, rethink religion, rethink Christianity, rethink church, and rethink what does it mean to follow Jesus. It also is a way for us to convey to the next generation that the greatest joy in our lives is following Jesus, worshiping Jesus, so that they will know. That is why we do what we do. And our goal here is always to lift high the name of Jesus. And I don't know if you've ever been in a worship service uh, where maybe you weren't feeling it that day. You're standing there, you're singing the songs, you're doing fine. Uh, you're doing what you're supposed to do. You're, you're, you're enjoying church the way you, you mostly do. But you see somebody off over there, some man, some woman, and they are absolutely lost in worship. They are enraptured. They are worshiping on a higher plane than you. And you say, wow. What is their experience with the Lord that makes them have so much passion and love and joy in their hearts for the Lord? I want to hear from that person. 
And then if you can imagine, if you can imagine that after the singing is done, that person actually comes up to the pulpit and starts giving this incredible testimony of who they are, the, the miry clay that they were stuck in, the difficulty that life had given them, the consequences of all of their actions, and then they start telling you how Jesus has redeemed their life. Isn't that a great story? Isn't that, that a great worship service? Isn't that, a, isn't that what church is? Shouldn't that be what church is so much of the time? We don't do a lot of testimonies in church uh, these days, and it would be so good for all of us if we could each just sort of learn how to share our testimony so that any person could come up here, stand in this pulpit, and say, let me tell you about myself, and let me tell you about Jesus. That would be great, and I hope that we can get to the point uh, in our church where we can have several people from our own congregation come up here and say, I'd like to tell you what I have been saved from. Okay? Uh, and it's, it, it's a simple formula, giving a testimony. It's not a simple thing, giving a testimony. Um, but a, this is a good little three-step process in how you give a testimony. Uh, what was your life like before you met Jesus? Okay? So think about your life. Uh, what was your life like before you met Jesus? And then, how did you come to know Jesus and start following? In, 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 other, in, in other words, who shared the gospel with you? How did you find out that there was a way out of the pit? How did you find out that there was a way to be redeemed and to have a new life? How did you find that out? And then, what has your life been like since you started following Jesus? Now, that little formula there may not work for everybody, uh, but it might be a good start for you to start thinking about if I were going to tell somebody my testimony, if I were that person worshiping so much and then it was my job to come up here and tell everybody why I worship and why I love the Lord so much, could I do that following that simple little thing uh, there? Now in Psalm chapter 30 today, we're going we're gonna to look at King David uh, doing sort of this thing, sort of this thing, um, but he does it. He, it's more than a three-step process for him. Uh, when I was looking at this psalm, when I was reading the different parts of it, I said, okay, this is what he's doing in these couple of verses. This is what he's doing in these couple of verses. This is what he's doing in these couple of verses. And this is what I sort of uh, discovered. Um, and, and I'm excited to preach this psalm this morning uh, because I felt like I had a real sort of a, an epiphany of how it goes. Because I looked at how David did it and I said, well, that's not exactly how we would do it. Sometimes when you read the Psalms, they're a little disjointed. And you might feel like, wait a second, is this one continuous story or is he flashing back here? I have no idea. But what we always need to remind ourselves is that um, the Psalms, actually none of the Bible, was written by any of our contemporaries. It wasn't written by any 21st century American. And so their way of thinking the flow of how they would tell a story can be very different, can be very different, all right? Um, and in fact, let's just pause right here, and I'm going to read, I'm going to read this psalm, and I'm actually, I'm going to read it one way, I'm going to read it the way it's written, and then I'm going to preach it in a different order, okay? That's a little bit weird, isn't it? But I'm very excited about it, okay? All right, so let's read Psalm chapter 30, 30 and Lord, help us as we read. I, I will exalt you, Lord, for you lifted me out of the depths, and did not let my enemies gloat over me. Lord, my God, I called to you for help, and you healed me. You, Lord, brought me up from the realm of the dead. You spared me from going down to the pit. Sing the praises of the Lord, you his faithful people. Praise his holy name, for his anger lasts only a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may stay for the night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. When I felt secure, I said, I will never be shaken. Lord, when you favored me, you made my royal mountain stand firm. But when you hid your face, I, felt I was dismayed. To you, Lord, I called. To the Lord, I cried for mercy. What is gained if I am silenced, if I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it proclaim, pro proclaim your faithfulness? Hear, Lord, and be merciful to me. Lord, be my help. You turned my wailing into dancing. You removed my sackcloth and clothed me with joy that my heart may sing your praises and not be silent. Lord my God, I will praise you forever. So in a, in a Western way of thinking, giving a testimony like this um, 
would consist of these things, okay? You would normally start out with mistakes made and sins committed. That's what you would start off with. That's what you would talk about. I would, you would say, I did this, I did this, I did this, and, and life just got, the word that they use in Celebrate Recovery is so great, life became unmanageable. Life became unmanageable. It was nothing but chaos around me, okay? Uh, and then after that, you say, well, then, uh, then I cried out to the Lord for help. I, I, I asked the Lord to forgive me and to, to redeem my life and, and remake my life all over again. And then you would start talking about how he did that. Uh, when I prayed to the Lord, this happened and this happened and this happened. He really did. He really did do something. He really did redeem my life. My life was completely changed after that. And then you would say, now, this is how I feel about it. This is how I feel about it. This is, you know, when I, before I felt so terrible all the time. Now I feel so much better. And then you would start, uh, end with by saying, and this is what you ought to do too. You would encourage people, push people, exhort people to say, hey, if I can do it, if I can be redeemed, if I can have some kind of recovery in my life, you can too. Okay? But that's not the order in which David uh, writes his testimony, if we want to think of it that way. In this one, we start off, with people, and then we crescendo up to God's great saving work, all right? And then we end with this conclusion that, uh, that, that sort of bookends this of, hey, this is what I was like, and if this is what you're like, let me tell you, this is what needs to happen in the middle. You need God's action in your life, okay? And that is a very logical way for a Westerner to think uh, about their testimony, and it's mostly chronological. It's mostly chronological. We, we think chronologically. But David... David's way of thinking is a little bit different, all right? When we start off with this, he starts off not with the mistakes that he made. He starts off with God's actions. This is what God does. And he, he, let me show you that he sort of bookends it with worship, okay? He, 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 he starts off, I will exalt you, and then he ends with, um, I will praise his name forever. So he bookends it all with worship, and in the middle, in the middle, he... Uh, he sort of, I don't know that he's crescendoing. I feel like his crescendos are at the beginning and the end. And here in the middle, he takes you to the low place, okay? We start at the low place, see God's action, and then sort of maybe are supposed to plateau from there or something like that. But, but he starts with, with a high point and he ends with a high point and the low part is in between, all right? It's a very different way of thinking. It's a different way of thinking. He just, he, we think chronologically and he thinks, what do I want you to feel at the beginning and the end. I want you to feel worship at the beginning and the end, okay? Whereas us, we're telling a story, okay? All right, so that's the, I'm going to preach it. I'm going to preach David's testimony here in a Western way, in a Western chronological way of thinking, okay? Let's see how fun it is when we do that, all right? <laughs> fun sermons. They're so much fun, aren't they? Nobody ever said that before but me. All right, so he starts off with, he starts off with, confessions. And in fact, I, would, I think if I were speaking, I'd almost start off with the middle of verse 7 here. Lord, when you favored me, you made my royal mountain stand firm. Okay? That, that's, that's sort of his beginning state. And you see, uh, that's not a confession of sins made or anything like that. But David is a person who was raised in the household of faith. This is what it was like always for me growing up. And, and I experienced the Lord's grace and favor upon me even when I was a kid. When I was just a kid, they anointed me and told me I was going to be king of Israel someday. Then after that, I slew the giant. It was incredible. And then people flocked to me and wrote songs about me. How more of God's favor could I possibly experience? God loves me so much, made a covenant with me that my descendants would be on the throne forever. What an incredible testimony to have. This is how he was raised. How would that make you feel? How would that make you react, though? And then he comes back and he said, I felt secure. And I said, I will never be shaken. Oh. In 1 John, he talks about these different sins and different categories of sins. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Of course, we're all subject to any of these, and I think David is subject to any of those three. But in this psalm right here, what is he talking about? He's talking about the pride of life. With, God's, with so much of God's favor upon him in his flesh, pride started to creep up. And he stopped thinking at some point, God is amazing. And he started thinking, I am amazing. 
God is so strong. No, I am so strong. God's plans will never be moved, never be shaken. God's kingdom will last forever. My kingdom will last forever. My kingdom will never be shaken. And he started to feel this incredible false security that he had. A false security because it's not in the Lord. Um, to me, it's a good... And I, I've, I've, I've confessed this before you several times, that we're all in here, we're all dirty, rotten, filthy sinners, right? Some of us got caught and some of us didn't. If you got caught, uh, then you've got a great testimony here for Celebrate Recovery. If you didn't get caught, you're still saying, I don't know if I should tell them that or not. And you become self-righteous, okay? You're looking at me, uh, maybe poster child, I don't know if poster child, but may, okay, maybe, I, maybe that's still poster child for self-righteous, for good kid who never got caught. And that's a good warning for me, because God's shown me an incredible amount of favor but if I think that I could never be shaken, if I think that nobody could ever find out the evil deeply lurking in my heart, that's a false sense of security in myself. If I start hiding things, and if I say, well, I'd give my testimony, but there's nothing to confess. Whew, dangerous ground right there. So David was in that position. Pride of life had him. I'll never be caught, I'll never be shaken. Everything is good for me now and always will be. God's kingdom is great. Basically, God's kingdom, my kingdom, it's the same thing. And then the Lord said, I've got to get this out of his life. In love, I would say, the Lord said, we've got to get this out of his life. And so what am I going to do? I'm going to hide my face from him. Or at least I'm going to make him feel that way. Actually, God is behind all of this. But David starts to say... Prayers aren't working. Favor's gone. Don't know what's going on here. And he's dismayed. He's dismayed. Even those people with squeaky clean lives at some point can get very dismayed because they feel like God is not listening to me anymore. The favor is gone. The grace is gone. It's not, maybe I just feel that way, but I'm starting to be shaken. Okay? So that's what he confesses. I got shaken. I made mistakes because I was living in a false sense of security in my own goodness, my own greatness, my own might, my own power, my own righteousness. And then there's something that's missing. Then there's something that's missing in this testimony that I thought is interesting. In any kind of celebrate recovery testimony or anybody giving their testimony of how they became a believer, there's going to be a point where somebody says, and then such and such shared the gospel with me. And that's not in this. There's not a place where he says, and then I heard the gospel, and then I heard the good news, and then they spoke the law to me. It's not in there. It's not in there. Why? Because remember who David is. He's somebody who grew up in the household of faith. He knows the gospel. This psalm to me reflects a lot of people who grew up in church and are living in a false sense of security in their own righteousness, and then when they're shaken, do they need somebody to come and preach the gospel to them? It always helps. But the fact is, all we really need to do sometimes is return to the good doctrine that we always knew. We always, we, were, we grew up with it, we, that we sing songs about it, that we cannot get the lyrics out of our head. The gospel is in us. And I, I don't know about you, if, if, but if you've never heard the gospel, okay, if you've heard the gospel, but you know that you've strayed from it, and you're not very secure in it, verbalize it. Say it out loud. What is the gospel? You need the gospel, preach it to yourself. It's in there. Just go back to children's church songs. It's all in there. But if you've never heard the gospel, well, that makes you different from David. That makes you different from David. And so let me preach the gospel to you very quickly. And if you'd like, I can give you a more expanded version after church. But this morning, I'll just say, you're going to get caught. Maybe you've been caught. You feel guilt. You feel shame. You know that you've got sin in your life that you fear and you ought to fear is going to be punished, well, I've got good news for you. Somebody stepped in the way and said, no, 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 don't punish them, punish me. And Jesus went to the cross to say, all the consequences, all the punishment for your sin, all the lostness that you felt from God, I'm going to take that upon myself so that you don't have to experience that. That is the good news, that God hates sin, God punishes sin because he's a good and righteous and holy God, Justice is in his heart. He wants the evil punished. 
But his love for you says, how, how, can I, how can I just destroy the people that I love? But he did that. His own son, whom he loved, destroyed him on the cross. And now he can look at you and say, don't worry, all my wrath is poured out. All the punishment is poured out on Jesus. And so I've got good news for you. If you'll just rest in Jesus' sacrifice, if you'll ask him to forgive you of your sins, go ahead and confess your sins to him and let him hear him say, all is forgiven. I'll apply my blood. Now you are forgiven. Now the punishment doesn't await you. And after you hear the good news, and after David goes back into his mind and reminds himself, or the Holy Spirit points out to him, by the way, you know you've sinned now, but what kind of God do you serve? A God full of grace and mercy and loving kindness. And so who does David turn to? And your temptation, always when you're caught, church folk, when you are caught, what are you going to turn to? Who are you going to turn to? What, what's going to happen after you get caught and after you know you've sinned? What are you going to do? Avoid the temptation. Resist the temptation to turn to anybody but Jesus for your forgiveness. Avoid the temptation. Resist the temptation to say, no, no, no I can make up for this. No, 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 I can redeem myself. No, 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 I can, uh, I, I can make amends here. I don't need the forgiveness. I can, I can do it myself. Resist all of that temptation and just fall at the feet of Jesus and say, to you, Lord, I called. To the Lord, I cried for mercy. What is gained if I am silenced, if I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it proclaim your faithfulness? Hear, Lord, and be merciful to me. Lord, be my help. And I... I I've pointed it out several times recently. I'm going to point it out again. When you see Lord in the Old Testament in all caps, it's using the name Yahweh or Jehovah. And for some of you, that, that means something. For other of you, that, that, that's beyond uh, your understanding. But what it really means is the God, not just any God, not a generic God, the God that I'm in a covenant with, the God who is in a covenant with me, the God who reached out to me, that's who I'm turning to. And in the New Testament for us, that's Jesus. Jesus reached out to us. Jesus came to us to institute a covenant with us. So it's to Jesus I called, to the Adonai, to the Lord, to my master I cried for mercy. If you're a slave and you've sinned against your master, do you expect to get any kind of mercy from your master? No, you expect to get the lash from your master. But what kind of master do we serve? A loving, kind, merciful master. To you, Jesus, I called. To my Lord, I cried for mercy. Hear, Lord, Lord Jesus, and be merciful to, to me. Lord Jesus, be my help. And then verse 9 to me is really funny because he starts bargaining with God. God, please save me. In fact, God, <clears throat> it's in your best interests if, if you save me too. If you're not going to save me for me, you need to save me for yourself because... What do I do? I proclaim. I talk about you. I teach people about you. If I go down to the pit, who's going to talk about you? Because I talk about you. Will the dust praise you? I worship you. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. If I just go down to dust, is anybody going to praise you? Lord, I think you want me around so that I can keep praising you, right? Uh, will the dust proclaim your faithfulness? No, but I will. If you redeem me, save me, Lord, I'll tell everybody about you, okay? So it's in your best interest to save me. Lord, I know you're loving and merciful, but even if you're not, let me go ahead and promise you that you want me telling this story, the story of my redemption. That's what you want. That's what you want. Because what is God's ultimate goal? The earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. So he appeals to God's ultimate goal. And says, Lord, if you don't want to be merciful for me, just think about your plans and your purposes and how I fit into them, and then maybe you'll be, still be merciful to me. I don't know if you've ever bargained with God, but that's probably the best bargaining chip you can get. Uh, but I would say to you, don't bargain with God. Just know in your heart he's merciful, gracious, loving, quick to forgive. You don't need to bargain with him. Jesus is your bargaining chip anyway. And then the, 
he experiences God's actions. He experiences God's actions. After he has reminded himself of God's good grace, reminded him and, and repented of his sins and said all of his prayer, guess what he sees? I will exalt you, Lord. Now he's going back. This is, this is verse 1 in the way David wrote it, but this is the middle of it for us, okay? The way we would think about it. I will exalt you, Yahweh, Jesus, for you lifted me out of the depths. I was in the depths. It was awful. It was really bad. You lifted me out of it and did not let my enemies gloat over me. Even people who don't like me now see the difference you've made in my life, Lord. Catch that? I see the difference you're making in my life. But actually, even other people can see it. And not just other people who know me and like me, even people who don't like me have to admit and say, well, I guess the Lord really is cleaning up his life. I guess the Lord really is. I guess church is really working out. I guess whatever, it's really working out. There really is this person whom I don't even like has really tapped into a power source that maybe I will need someday. You didn't let my enemies gloat over me. They're going to stand back and they're going to marvel and they're going to say, you know what, Jesus worked out for this person. Maybe he'll work out for me too. Lord, my God, I called to you for help and you healed me. It's all, it's holistic here. Body, soul, mind, everything. So much better than I used to be. You, Lord, brought me up from the realm of the dead. You spared me from going down to the pit. When you see those words in the Old Testament, just think hell. Um, except that uh, in the Old Testament, they didn't have a whole co- much of a concept of heaven and hell. When, when they, uh, in the New Testament, all of heaven, everything we know about heaven really is from the New Testament. All the details we know about heaven. In the Old Testament, you mostly get people whispering a hope that it's true. Because nothing has really been revealed about it. So when they think of the afterlife, what can they possibly conceptualize? Down into the bowels of the earth. That is where they are. Is it good down there? No. The abundance is up here. What's down there? Cold, darkness, deep. We dig so far in the earth, it never ends. It's a pit that never ends. What is that place? And I don't want to go there. I know I will someday. I know everybody does someday. But I don't want to go down there before my appointed time. But David says, I was on the precipice of it. I was, I was like Ebenezer Scrooge uh, in his final vision of Christmas future, clinging, whose name is on the tombstone, clinging, trying to, grabbing at roots, trying to get out of the pit, but he falls down into it. But that's where David was, and God brought him up out of it. Incredibly. Whew. I was that close, but the Lord saved me from going down to the pit. And I will tell that story forever. And I will be glad to tell my enemies how close it was. But God saved me out of it. And so what's the emotional worshipful response after that? You turned my wailing into dancing. There was going to be a party. It was going to be a funeral party. But it's a different kind of party now. You removed my sackcloth, and that is my funeral clothing, and clothed me with joy. I took off my black dress and put on something with sequins. All right? And we turned off Hank Williams Sr., and we put on the Beach Boys. All right? The whole party changed because of what Jesus did for me. And my heart now sings your praises, and will not be silent. I will not be silent. There's no way I can contain myself. I have to talk about this. The joy, the salvation that I've experienced compels me to tell my story every chance I get. Lord my God, I will praise you forever. And then we would end with advice for people. So, That's my story. Now let's talk about you. What do you need to do? Are you in the depths? Are you on the the edge of the pit, just about to fall in? This is my advice. Sing praises to the Lord, you his faithful people. Praise his holy name. Do you think God's mad at you? Don't worry. His anger only lasts for a night. But joy comes in the morning. 
He can give you new life, new lease on life. Turn the page, and it'll all be different in him. I know that you're sorry right now. I know that you're weeping. I know that there's pain. But I promise you, as soon as you meet Jesus, you'll start rejoicing. It'll be a new morning in your life, new chapter, whole new book even in your life. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know how dark the storms of life are right now. But I promise you, Jesus can calm the storm. And if, even if he doesn't calm the storm, remember, Jesus slept at the back of the boat during the storm. He remains calm in all of it. He can give you that same peace. He can point you to true north. If you don't know how to live, you don't know what's, what's good, what's bad anymore, he can point you to true north. You need to believe in something. You need to believe in something new. Jesus is that new person to believe in. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the new life you've been looking for. And I hope, I know that many here can give that same testimony, and I hope that any one of you here who haven't experienced the love and redemption of Jesus will soon have that testimony to Jesus is why we worship. This psalm, at the very beginning of it, you'll notice, a song for the dedication of the temple. Uh, and then it says it's a psalm of David. Well, let me, let me just come back here and say something. That's, that's kind of strange because the temple wasn't built in David's lifetime. David wanted to build the temple, but he never got the chance. His son Solomon built the temple. And so I don't know if David said, this, uh, this is the one I want you to re read. When you, when you build the temple, Solomon, this is the one I want you to sing. This is the song for the dedication of the temple. Or maybe Solomon said, Whew, my dad wrote this one. This is a good one. This is my favorite one. I, this is going to be, when we dedicate the temple next week, this is the one we're going to sing. I don't know how that worked out historically. But I can tell you this. This church exists for these kinds of testimonies. So that people who are in the pits, who are in the miry clay, who feel like they are very near to death and certainly in spiritual death, can come here, meet Jesus, have their entire life redeemed, and then stand up here and say, let me tell you about my experience with Jesus. Let me tell you why I worship. And this temple, this church building, this congregation should be dedicated to stories like that. All right? Let's pray. Lord, we love you. And I pray, Lord, that you will make us a people who have such incredible, wonderful testimonies that we are compelled to share them with everyone we meet so that those people can also have testimonies that say basically the same thing. I was at the end of myself, and then I found Jesus, and I started truly living again. Help us, Lord to be a church dedicated to stories like this. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Have a good afternoon. Stay cool. Stay dry. <laughs> You're dismissed. <laughs>